I'm, I'm switching immediately to the to the next uh, presentation, and in this case, it's a paper by uh, Pier Paolo Benigno together um, with Gianluca Benigno. Pier Paolo is from the University of Bern, and he's presenting also a topic that's very high on the minds of uh, many policymakers for the moment, and that's managing monetary policy normalization, and particularly on the sequencing. Um, given that we have a, a variety of tools that central banks deploy, how, how do you manage this monetary policy normalization? Please go ahead, Pier Paolo. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Isabel, and uh, for the invitation to this conference. It's a pleasure to be here, so let me share my presentation. So, as you say, it is a joint work with Gianluca Benigno, and uh, I would say it's, uh, as you mentioned, you know, it's a quite relevant topic right now because uh, after uh, having uh, expanded balance sheet and uh, pursue zero interest rate policy, central banks are now concerned about normalization. And on top of this normal normalization, there are also other shocks which are in some way uh, asking for more uh, for this, for for a higher speed uh, of rising rates and eventually reducing the balance sheets. Um, so here we are basically more concerned about you know a standard uh, approach in which you enter a liquidity trap and then the shock vanishes and then you ask how you exit the liquidity trap, both from uh, the case of interest rate policy and balance sheet. Uh, I have to say that. Uh, uh, there is no much literature on, uh, in general, the, the pace and the timing of quantitative tightening in combination with the zero lower bound and the lift off of the policy rate, whether, you know, quantitative tightening should uh, come early than uh, the lift off or later or at which pace. So this paper is, is going to study this. And obviously it's going to uh, be a model in which uh, uh, balance sheet policy are relevant. Uh, so what we do, we study an economy in a liquidity trap uh, in which uh, reserves are a relevant tool of policy on top of the interest rate policy. And there we characterize the managing of QE and QT together with the zero lower bound policy. So, so what are the results that I'm going to stress. So under optimal policy, reserve should increase lately in a liquidity trap. So not uh, shouldn't be the uh, early use in the trap, but it should pick up later. And before the lift off of the policy rate, they should reach the peak and then we withdraw at the slow pace. And this is the result under standard cal calibration. Then we're going to have a case in which there are higher spreads in money markets before entering into the liquidity trap, those uh, conditions require a larger QE stimulus and uh, a similar withdrawal with respect to the previous case, when instead central banks are more concerned for output stabilization, again, there is a request for a larger QE and a faster QT. So let me uh, present uh, the framework and this is going to be what I say what I call a general framework for monetary policy analysis because uh, it's going in some way to nest uh, uh, as a particular case the new Vixelian new Keynesian framework. Uh, the characteristic of the new Vixelian uh, new Keynesian framework is that central bank can control inflation and output by just using one tool the policy rate which is usually in this model, the interest rate on reserves. And in general, reserves, although are a policy tool, are irrelevant for inflation and output. Instead, the more general framework that we uh, develop in this paper uh, gives an independent role to reserve as a tool for controlling inflation and output. And there are some features of the transmission mechanism that I'm going first to uh, describe in words and then through a simple uh, example. So the main characteristic is that the consumption saving choices, so usually the Euler equation uh, that characterizes these choices, uh, depend on the interest rate on a liquid asset. 
and uh, which is not the policy rate. And the in demand of liquid asset by the household depends instead of the liquidity spread between liquid and illiquid securities. Here it comes the role of the central bank because the central bank and the treasury are the supplier of liquid asset, which are backed by reserves in the case of, uh, for example, deposits uh, of commercial bank. And they also determine uh, through the interest rate on reserve, the interest rate on liquid asset. So by controlling the quantity of reserve and the interest rate on liquid asset, then the central bank can have an influence on the demand of liquid asset and influence also the interest rate on liquid asset. So this is the mechanism, and uh, let me describe it uh, through uh, uh, detailing what I said through some equation. So here we have a Euler equation which relate uh, consumption in uh, uh, the uh, today to consumption tomorrow. But the relevant interest rate here is what we call the natural nominal rate of interest, which doesn't coincide with the policy rate. That's the rate on a liquid asset. Then uh, the demand of liquid securities, you can see here, depends on the liquidity premium in a negative way, because this is the marginal utility of, uh, that you get from liquid securities. And uh, uh, it depends on the natural nominal rate of interest, which is the interest rate on illiquid securities and the interest rate, let's say, on deposit, which are liquid securities. So uh, what is happening here is that uh, uh, the central bank doesn't enter into any of these equations. Uh, so it works through the banking sectors in which the deposit rate is going in equilibrium to be related to the policy rate. So by controlling the policy rate, the central bank can in some way control the deposit rate and then act to control the natural nominal rate of interest, which affect the consumption service choices. So uh, when I combine this equation, I actually get a relation between this rate, which affect the consumption service choices, IB, and the policy rate, IR. So uh, the relation, as you see, is not direct, is, is proportional, but is not one-to-one -one because there is a term which is going to depend on the liquidity uh, premium and cessation. But what is more important is that to control uh, the rate IB, you need to specify both the interest rate on reserve and the quantity of reserve, which is going to affect the liquidity into the economy. So this is the new channel. And when, for example, this marginal utility of Q is uh, VQ is zero, then you're back to the new Keynesian model. Uh, so this is going to be a model in which uh, uh, the two, two tools, interest rate on reserves and quantity of reserves are going to influence consumption saving choices. And so they're relevant tools. Okay, so let me let's skip the uh, literature review and uh, go to present the model. So there's going to be a very simple in this uh, paper, but we have a more complicated framework in another uh, companion paper, uh, banking model, in which uh, intermediaries live for two periods and are subject to limited liability constraints, which here is quite irrelevant because these intermediaries do, do not face any, any, any risk in their balance sheet. So they can basically uh, invest in reserve and in illiquid asset, which are risk-free. They issue deposit and they have equity. And uh, they are subject to some collateral can be, uh, or regulatory requirement, can be implicit or explicit form, and which say that reserve should be uh, a, a fraction, a larger, uh, <laughs> It should be a fraction of deposit with this row, which is between zero and one. So given this setup, profits of intermediary are going to depend 
on the return on their asset, which are this liquid asset that have the interest rate IB, which is the one I showed you before, and the return on reserve, which is the interest rate on reserves. And at the same time, they pay their liability with the interest rate B. So where is the uh, in, uh, limited liability constraints? It's just ask that the profits of intermediary should be non-negative. So in this model, intermediary are maximizer, maximize strengths, subject to the limited liability constraints and to the collateral requirement. And it, the, this simple framework delivers a simple result. So the one I showed you before, so that the interest rate on deposit is going to be a weighted average of the interest rate on reserve and on this natural nominal rate of interest, which is the interest rate on li liquid debt, debt with illiquid characteristics, so that doesn't provide uh, liquidity to agent. While the demand of equity in this model just comes from the uh, collateral constraint, it shouldn't be negative. Otherwise, uh, sorry, the, uh, the limited liability constraints, otherwise profits would be negative. So what is interesting is that uh, there are conditions in which the Neovixenian framework is nested through this banking model. One is when reserves are very abundant so that the collateral constraints doesn't bind. So in that case, all these interest rates are the same. And we have the traditional transmission mechanism in which reserves are irrelevant for inflation and output. The other case is, is the one in which rho is equal to zero. So when you don't need reserve to satisfy collateral constraints, whether this is imposed by the government or is something in the banking sector, and in this case, all interest rates are also equalized. So in some way, reserves also in this case do, do not offer any uh, non-pecuniary service uh, to the banking sector. However, you know, a case which is interesting and we are going to analyze is when uh, rho is equal to one, then uh, uh, it's true in this case that the interest rate on deposit is equal to that on illiquid asset, on, on reserves, but those rates may be lower than the interest rate on illiquid asset. So here, uh, it's a case also that is going to nest in some way a case in which central bank issued digital currency, for example, in some form like deposit of household held at the central bank. Okay, so let's go to the other part of the model, households. They get utility from consumption and liquidity services. And uh, in particular, the liquidity services are provided by two types of securities, treasury notes and deposit. And both are substitutes, so they get the same interest rate, ITD, which is going to be determined in equilibrium. Agents can also borrow and lend in liquid private securities, which are BT, and they have a different rate, which is the one I was mentioning before, the natural nominal rate of interest, ITB. So optimality condition from this household with standard separable preference between consumption and liquidity services so you get the Euler equation, which is the same I showed you before, but in a stochastic environment. And then the demand of liquidity, which is going to equate the marginal rate of substitution between liquidity and consumption to the spread between illiquid asset and liquid asset. So this is going to be the Q demand that we had before. Agents also supply labor in this model. And the firm use labor to produce good and are subject to the standard model of uh, price rigidity as in the new Keynesian framework. Here, you know, we're going to integrate treasury and central bank for simplicity. And we basically assume that they share same characteristic with respect to reserve and debt. So the overall issuance of reserves and debt securities by the treasury is governed by uh, is given by the previous uh, level of debt and the previous level of reserves and their different interest rate because in principle those can have different interest rate and taxes are a way to reduce this uh, overall uh, liability of the government. 
contrary to the new Keynesian framework, the tax policy is going to be very critical for the determination of prices and for the relevance of reserve policy. So um, I'm going to present the model in a simple way, in a log linear approximation. So the model is going to be consistent with the same aggregate supply equation as in the new Keynesian model, which inflation depends on output gap and expected future inflation. What is more complicated here is the aggregate demand block. Here is the approximation of the Euler equation, and that would be enough if this was if this were the policy rate, but it is not the policy rate. So you need the transmission mechanism there. And here we have two other elements. We have the demand of liquidity, which depends on output and on the spread between liquid and illiquid asset. And we have the banking uh, relation between interest rate on money market, which is going to say that the natural nominal rate, rate of interest depends on the interest rate on reserves and on the spread between liquid and illiquid asset. So note again that these v, v parameters is quite important because it indicates the degree of cessation of liquidity in the economy. When V is equal to zero, we are in a fully satiated economy with liquidity, and then all the interest rates are going to be uh, equalize and co move in the same way. So all money market rates are going to be in the same uh, direction, and this is going to nest exactly the new Keynesian framework. Again, on top of the other two elements I was discussing before in the uh, banking uh, sector. Now, what is interesting is that these three equations can be combined to deliver a new aggregate demand equation, which is uh, uh, similar uh, to what we think is the standard uh, demand equation in new Keynesian model, but there's some features which are interesting here. So the first feature is that here in front of this uh, uh, future output, we have a coefficient which is uh, less than one. So basically when you iterate forward this equation, this equation is going to give you less importance of forward guidance in influencing the current uh, demand. The second important element here is the, the influence of liquidity on demand. So higher liquidity is push aggregate demand. And that's how reserves are going to matter in this model. And here we have the policy rate. So you see the combination of the two policy entering through the aggregate demand equation. Um, so we make an analysis of optimal policy, and I'm going to present a case which gives a sort of trivial answer, and then we're going to have a more complicated case. And the case with a trivial, let's say, straightforward answer is when lump sum taxes are available. And as I said before, taxes becomes very relevant in this context. So the objective function uh, which is a second order approximation of the welfare of the consumer in this model is going to have the standard form in which central bank should care about the output gap and inflation uh, with respect to the target. But there's also a new element, which is uh, the distance between uh, the liquidity in the system and the association level of liquidity. So when QT is equal to Q star, then cessation is rich in the economy and uh, liquidity is at the, uh, at the first best. Now, when you look at this problem and you make an analysis of optimal policy as a, a very straightforward conclusion, uh, which is that basically there is no trade-off. So optimal policy should reach, should, liquidity should be such to reach the full cessation and then inflation and output should be stabilized to the target. And this happens also if you are at this, if you have shocks that bring you the economy at the zero lower bound. So what I mean, it means that the liquidity policy is to reach cessation, while here there is going to be a trade-off, you know, the standard trade-off in uh, stabilizing inflation and output because of the presence of the zero lower bound. But uh, uh, the model, 
doesn't change the conclusion of the standard literature in this case. There is a caveat, things are going to change a little bit, but not much when preferences are not separable between consumption and liquidity. But in general, you know, even this framework can say something on uh, liquidity policy and say that basically if they are not set optimally at the beginning of the liquidity trap, then increasing uh, reserves lowers the stay at the zero amount. So, and that's the only case in which in this type of analysis they would matter. So let me uh, show you uh, this case. Here we have a different row, but uh, uh, just focus on this line, the QT equal to zero. So that would be uh, the case, the standard uh, model in which you have a shock bringing you to the liquidity trap. You see interest rate staying 13 quarters here, uh, sorry, so 15 quarters to the zero lower bound and then going up. You see inflation going down and then up. And then you see the output gap going down and then up. So that's the standard optimal response uh, of policy uh, to condition then bring the economy to the liquid uh, to, to the zero lower amount. Now, if QT is not set optimally, then you have this response. Now, if you rise QT, then you're going to see, you see, that is going to lower. So if liquidity rise, then you're going to lower the stay at the zero lower amount. So obviously, if you start from condition in which liquidity is not uh, it doesn't reach cessation, then if you have a shock, then bring the economy to the liquidity trap, if you increase liquidity into the system, then it's going to stimulate aggregate demand and it's going to require lower stay at the zero lower bound. So it's actually offsetting the shocks that bring you at the zero lower bound. But as I say, this is, I think, the less interesting case. So what is more interesting is when uh, there are distortionary taxes. And here we make a simplifying assumption, which is going to say that the liquidity constraint just say that to back deposit, you need reserve. Uh, and uh, uh, in this case, the interest rate on deposit is equal exactly to the interest rate on reserves. Now, what is relevant when taxes are distortionary, it becomes the intertemporal resource constraints of the economy which is going to imply that Q, which is going to be the sum of reserves and treasury debt. So the, the value of Q at time T, uh, so this is the outstanding debt divided prices, should be backed, should be equal more than backed by the uh, present discounted value of the taxes uh, that the government levy here in a distortionary way. So taxes are proportional to income. Then there is still an exogenous transfer, which is helpful in our uh, model. And, you know, you can have some resources also coming from the fact that Q have liquidity uh, properties. And in this way, the interest rate on R can be lower than B. It is gives some, let's say, rents to the government in a way to uh, back the level of debt. So these constraints become a relevant constraints for the optimal policy problem when you have distortionary taxes. Usually when you have lump sum taxes, this constraint is no longer, is, is let's say, residual. You can uh, use lump sum taxes to fulfill it. But with distortionary taxes, this becomes relevant. And therefore, the optimal supply of liquidity has to consider these constraints. So when you analyze the optimal supply of liquidity in the economy, Q, in the steady state, you find that it does not imply any more full cessation. So basically, in this model with distortionary taxes, the optimal steady state policy of liquidity is not to satiate the economy, but to keep actually some uh, spread in the money market. And we can see from this condition in which uh, the marginal uh, utility of liquidity is positive because these fee are non negative Lagrange multiplier and this second derivative is negative because of the shape that you want to have for the liquidity demand function close to satiation. So, uh, 
What is important is that in the previous yeah, case, when lump sum taxes, have five minutes. There's okay, five minutes yeah. left. Yeah. When you have lump sum taxes available, uh, these parameters is zero. So uh, the optimal policy is to the optimal steady state is to have a full cessation of liquidity. So. Given this setup, the model becomes a bit complicated, but not much. The loss function is still similar as before, but you have an additional terms again, which uh, characterize the deviation of liquidity from this optimal steady state I described before. The aggregate supply equation change because these taxes are now distortionary. So you see equation number four. Uh, Equation number five is doesn't does not change, and you can see that you know you have the uh, less than one coefficient with respect to future output, and then you have uh, the uh, liquidity that affect demand. Uh, so this is the aggregate demand equation, and the problem is also subject to the intertemporal budget constraints I showed you before in a log linear approximation. Now we make the analysis such that when uh, this variable ft year that is called the fiscal stress is zero then you can achieve a full stabilization of output inflation and qt and uh, this is compatible with the intertemporal budget constraints of the government but obviously you know when uh, the zero lower bound is non-binding but when the zero lower bound is binding even if ft is going to be zero you're going to have a trade-off and that's what is going to be analyzed here Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the optimal policy here with suboptimal policy. And those are two classes of suboptimal policy. Let me just tell you in words. First type of policy is, a, uh, is, not, is, a, is a only one policy, but in which tax policy is doing something and monetary policy is doing something. So monetary policy is try to fix inflation in the target if it can. If it cannot, it has to set the policy rate to zero. So it's a very strict inflation targeting policy. And the fiscal authority doesn't vary the tax rate. OK, so what you get is a standard result in which the suboptimal policy are really suboptimal. And here you can see that uh, the optimal policy, when you look at the interest rate, asks you to stay longer at the zero lower bound. So this is the standard result in the literature. Now, what is interesting is uh, uh, what policy is asking in terms of liquidity. So the dash blue line is the policy in, is the outcome in the suboptimal policy and the dark line uh, is the uh, straight line is the uh, uh, liquidity policy under optimal policy. So you can see actually that you don't want to increase liquidity, but you only do later in the trap. And then uh, just before the lift of, of the policy rate, you start to withdraw liquidity and you withdraw very slowly. OK, now the other characteristic of optimal policy, which is uh, in line with other studies, is that you raise the taxes at the beginning and you lower that in the uh, when the shock disappears. And that's because you want to push inflation up. You can see that after an optimal policy, inflation is really stabilized here. Okay, um, let me show you something interesting in the uh, few time that I have. Uh, now, what we find under this optimal policy is that, okay, if we shut down liquidity and say, okay, central bank doesn't use liquidity, then everything doesn't change much. So it seems that there is no much role of reserves in affecting the enter and the exit of the liquidity trap. Uh, we ask what is going to happen if money market spread are higher. So if money market spread are higher, this is going to rise this parameter V uh, in the uh, demand equation and possibly this is giving much more role to QT in affecting aggregate demand. Um, and the calibration we do here is to have this V at 4%, which are spreads that we have seen just before the financial crisis. Now, when we compare the optimal policy with uh, a constant liquidity policy in this case, which is the red line and the, uh, and the black line, we see that basically 
uh, they imply the same liftoff of the policy rate. So liquidity and non-liquidity doesn't change much the exit, the time you stay at the zero lower bound. What is happening uh, with larger credit spread that you see now comparing the blue line and the dark line here with real liquidity is that you increase liquidity more. Before you were not increasing liquidity, but now you increase liquidity more, you pick just before the lift of, of the policy rate, and then you go down and then very, very slowly. La last uh, figure, which is interesting, I guess, is when central bank cares more about output guard. This kind of model, new Keynesian model, gives too much weight to inflation with respect to uh, output. And indeed, all the figure before, you know, say, okay, yes, we try to stabilize inflation more than output. Now we consider a case in which you try to give more weight to the output gap uh, objective in the stabilization uh, problem. And here things are very interesting. So when we compare optimal policy, the suboptimal policy with the blue line and the liquidity and the constant liquidity policy, which you don't use uh, balance sheet policy at all. Now, you can see that liquidity pick up a lot. So you increase liquidity a lot here and before the trap, but then you withdraw it very, very fast. And now the liquidity policy, by comparing the optimal policy and the constant liquidity policy as an effect, because if you use liquidity, you don't stay so much long at the zero lower bound, but you stay, uh, you go out early. Only if you don't use liquidity, you stay longer, okay? But you see that you start to withdraw liquidity early, and then at the time in which the policy rate is normalized, also liquidity start to be normalized. So the intuition here is the following. When uh, you give a lot of weight to output gap, and you can see here that you stabilize output uh, during uh, the, the shock, actually, and you let a bit of inflation to vary, more during the shock, then you want to use a lot the liquidity policy unless the interest rate policy. While instead, when you care more about inflation, even during the trap, so you try to stabilize inflation well at the 2% target, even during the trap, then there uh, you don't want to use much liquidity policy and you want to use actually more the tax policy. And actually, you see here that the tax policy goes completely on the other side, that you lower taxes at the beginning of the trap and you rise taxes at the end of the trap. So this is actually the way you boost a bit inflation at the beginning of the trap, and then you lower it at the end of the trap. Okay, so let me conclude by saying that this uh, represented what I hope is a general framework to understand the effectiveness of reserves as an additional tool for monetary policy making, in which next, under some particular condition, uh, the new Keynesian framework. And the determination of inflation is a function of three important policy tools, tax, reserves, and interest rate. And obviously, it's not a conclusive analysis on uh, the pace and the speed and the timing of uh, QE and QT, but at least, you know, I think he provides uh, some elements uh, for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pia Paolo. I immediately pass the forum to Elisa Rubo from the University of Chicago, who has prepared a discussion of the paper. All right, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. Um, all right, so um, there is a large literature of new Keynesian models uh, that consider uh, unconventional policies to address the zero lower bound. So as Pier Paolo was saying, um, there is a large set of policies that received a lot of attention, such as forward guidance, uh, government spending, or tax policy. Uh, but uh, the novelty of this paper is to consider instead the role of uh, reserve management and liquidity management. Um, so uh, the authors make a simple argument for um, how this works. Essentially, they argue that in the real world, there is not just one um, interest rate uh, on safe assets. There is actually two. One is the, um, the nominal rate faced by households uh, in their consumption saving decision, like the Euler equation. 
uh, and the other is the reserve rate. Uh, and typically the reserve rate is gonna be uh, smaller than the, uh, the actual interest rate faced by households. Um, and the reserve rate is what the central bank has control uh, over. And um, increasing um, the amount of reserve in the economy is going to lower the um, gap, to, to decrease the gap between the um, nominal rate faced by household and the reserve rate. Um, and so in particular, when the reserve rate is stuck at zero, um, increasing the amount of reserve is, uh, is very useful because it is just going to lower the, the nominal rate that goes into the Euler equation, and this has um, the desired uh, stimulative effect on the economy. Um, so this is a great benefit. It comes at a cost, which is uh, that essentially increasing the amount of reserves increases the government uh, balance sheet, and this is financed through taxation, um, and taxation is distortionary. So this is the argument in a nutshell. Um, I really like the, the positive model of reserve management that this, uh, this, uh, this paper provides. Um, so in this discussion, I will briefly uh, review the, a bit more in detail uh, the argument of the model. Um, and then I will mostly focus my comments uh, on the normative implications of the model. So I think the normative implications are also kind of the more innovative um, aspect of the paper um, in the sense that uh, we have like not very many, but some models uh, of central bank uh, balance sheet and reserve management, such, like, such as the work of Monica Piazzisi and Martin Schneider. Uh, but I think this work doesn't really focus on the normative implication of optimal reserve management. So this is really the, the new aspect of this paper. Um, and I think the paper provides a great baseline to think about optimal policy. Um, but I would encourage the others to think a bit deeper uh, about a few questions that I will at, outline in the discussion. Um, in particular, as they point out, uh, the role of uh, tax taxation and like the management of, of taxation is, is crucial and it's jointly determined uh, with the reserve policy. So I will discuss a bit like how this could potentially change depending on the tax instruments that are available. Uh, and then I will try and discuss a bit more the composition of the central bank assets portfolio. So in the paper, essentially the central bank is buying government bonds. Uh, but in practice, central banks uh, might buy other assets, like a richer set of assets. And I think this really interacts with the cost and benefits of issuing liquidity. <laughs> All right, so let me uh, jump through the, the model. Um, I will not uh, show many equations. I will just like provide like a schematic um, summary of the argument. So in this world, there are going to be um, two main agents. Um, on the, that determine the asset market, sorry. <coughs> uh, the private banks and the government. And by government, I'm going to mean like as a, as a, like the, the joint set of like the fiscal authority and the central bank. So in the balance sheet of private banks, uh, the assets are reserves and private bonds. So essentially banks are lending to uh, the central bank through reserves and to the consumers through the private bonds. And uh, on the liabilities, uh, banks are financed through deposits and equity that are both, both uh, end up being held by the consumers. Um, the government balance sheet has on the asset side tax revenues and seniorage from, well, the, the lower interest rate they pay on reserve compared to the market interest rate. Um, and on their liabilities, they will have the reserves, that is like how they get financed through the central bank and government bonds. All right. And the two liquid assets that the consumers can hold are the government bonds and the deposits. So importantly, uh, we will show that, um, like the authors show, that um, by changing the composition of the government liabilities, uh, the, the government actually can change the amount of uh, liquid assets that are available uh, to the consumer in a way that I will, um, that the peer file explain and I will review in a second. Um, but the important thing in the model is that there are going to be meaningful spreads between the returns uh, on these assets. Um, so there is some utility benefit from holding liquid assets, which determines a spread between the private issued bond, bonds uh, rate, that is ID, and the, um, the return on deposits. So essentially, deposits are liquid, so they pay a lower return. Uh, moreover, there is going to be, in general, a spread between the deposit uh, rate and the reserve rate, because banks are constrained to back um, deposits with reserves. All right. Um, so, great. 
All right, so uh, the government in this, uh, in this setting has two ways uh, of increasing the, uh, the amount of liquidity. One is to change the composition of the government liabilities, and the other is to increase the size of the government balance sheet. All right, so uh, thinking of thinking again uh, on the uh, thinking back on the previous slide, uh, why does changing the composition of liabilities uh, affect the amount of reserves in the economy? Well, essentially to the extent that um, deposits can grow more than one-on-one -on -one with reserves, increasing the shift in the composition of the balance sheet away from government bonds and towards reserves is going to increase the capacity of banks to generate deposits and deposits are liquid assets, so this is going to increase the amount of liquidity in the economy. But this channel works only if the um, the reserves, sorry, the, deposit, the deposits need not be backed one for one with reserves. As long as they need to be backed one for one, then the only way that the central bank has to increase the amount of liquid assets in the economy is to just increase the size of its balance sheet. And this can be done either for reserves or government bonds. But the problem um, of, of doing this is that um, essentially uh, the central bank is going to have to pay more interest because it's borrowing more and paying interest require raising taxes. And so taxes are distortionary, so this has a cost. So basically increasing the amount of liquidity has a cost. Um, so essentially we have a meaningful trade-off at this point uh, in the choice of the optimal amount of liquidity. And the authors show that there is a different trade-off in steady state and in a case where there is a ZLB. So in, in steady state, the trade-off is between the utility benefit um, of increasing the amount of liquidity and the cost of raising liquidity coming from distortionary taxation. Um, as a result of the trade-off, uh, in steady state liquidity demand will not be uh, satiated. All right. uh, when uh, the ZLB binds, well, uh, the authors show that there is a, um, an incentive to deviate from the optimal uh, liquidity tax uh, trade-off. Uh, and in particular, increasing liquidity, as we explained before, helps lowering the meaningful nominal rate for households. And therefore, it can mitigate the fall of um, outputs and prices um, at the ZLB for a given promised future uh, path of these variables. All right. And the nice, the very nice thing of the paper is that the authors uh, show that the loss function um, that describe welfare in this paper um, is very similar in a way to the, to the traditional New Keynesian loss function. It's like a quadratic loss function that depends on output and inflation with this new, like output gap and inflation gap with this new uh, third gap that pops out, uh, that is the liquidity gap. All right, so uh, here I have a few comments about the way that they uh, think about optimal policy. So the authors show that there is a rich dynamic, there is an interdependence between reserves, um, taxes, um, and output and inflation. Um, and so the timing of the reserve accumulation matters, and it depends on the weight of inflation versus output. One benchmark that I would have liked to see to understand a bit better where these dynamics come from um, is actually a benchmark where there is uh, no active liquidity or tax management. And my understanding of all the policies that were shown in the paper is that they either have active liquidity management or active tax management. But for me, the benchmark uh, in this kind of ZLB literature is, for example, the learning papers where there is no active liquidity or tax management, but the central bank at the same time is realizing the value of like promising like higher future output or inflation. Um, so I think like either the central bank was super naive and it didn't even do this last thing of like thinking of like forward guidance, uh, or it was like sophisticated enough that it would consider some active liquidity or tax management. But I think the, there was a bit of this missing comparison that I thought would be uh, actually useful. Um, and another point that I think is very important actually is that the assumptions about the tax instruments matter a lot for what the optimal policy is gonna look like. So in the paper, the only tax instrument is the an output tax um, on like producers or consumers, but there is no wage subsidy. So essentially raising this tax is gonna create inflation uh, and uh, it's gonna lower the real wage uh, and so depress labor supply. So increasing inflation is good, but depressing labor supply is bad. And so we see immediately that if the central bank cares a lot about inflation, stabilizing inflation, um, then it, uh, it wants this tax because there is deflation, so we want to counteract that. But if it cares about output, then it actually doesn't want much of this tax. 
Um, and I think that is kind of like key, like the the use or not use of this instrument is kind of key for then there is the result about how the central bank is using reserves uh, in the model. Um, another, and, and I, I'll just like show this with a couple graphs. So we see that here the central bank cares about inflation, so it actually is raising the tax. So it stimulates, it creates inflation um, and it lets the output gap fall. But uh, as soon as the central bank cares about uh, the output, or oh, okay, sorry, I messed up actually. I put the same time, the same, the, I put twice the same figure. <laughs> sorry about that. But anyway, in the other figure, the output gap is very stable and actually the tax goes down and then up. So it's like the opposite path of the tax. Um, I ap apologize for the mix up. Um, but anyway, just to make the point that I think uh, the the tax rate is uh, like it's kind of the the different evolution of the tax rate is kind of key to the to the results and uh, and that also must interfere with the reserve determination. So I think that's a point to clarify. And another reason why I think the taxation part is important is that we know that um, if we had instead of just the output tax also a wage subsidy, then we would be able to basically stabilize the ZLB just with the tax policy. So I think this is a a point that the others should address, like they could see maybe it's not realistic to assume that we can manage taxes so well, although in their model there is quite a bit of active tax management. So I think this is just a point, like a, I think it's a pushback that the authors may encounter and I think it would be important to address. Um, all right, so let me basically conclude. This is my uh, last slide um, with a, a bit of a broader discussion of the trade off behind uh, issuing liquidity. Um, so I think in a large set of models, uh, as increase, or like especially heterogeneous agents model, which is different from the representative agent case in this paper, uh, increasing the amount of government debt, so increasing the amount of liquidity is a way to transfer resources to borrowing constrained agents. And that increases the output. So that could be because um, low MPC savers essentially can borrow or can lend to high MPC borrowers by buying government bonds and like the bonds pay like a rebate to everyone. Um, and another uh, another role of uh, having liquidity is that it per permits to channel resources from unproductive savers to productive entrepreneurs. Um, so in both cases, I think um, it might be important to model um, a bit more in detail the sources of the liquidity benefits. And especially I think this is important if we consider that um, a scenario where the central bank is not just buying government bonds, but it's directly buying uh, private assets. So I think this is important in changing the trade-off in the model because essentially the need to raise taxes was coming from an expansion of the amount of government borrowing in the model. But if the government is just buying private assets and actually making a return, like making money out of those private assets because they are paying a, an interest rate higher than the reserve rate at which the government is borrowing at, then the government is actually even a rebate. It's not, um, it's not in need of raising taxes. So I think the composition of the central bank's uh, asset portfolio can be very important in changing both the benefits and the cost uh, of issuing liquidity. Um, of course, um, this kind of requires taking a stance, like do we think that the central bank is kind of stepping in where credit is constrained, a bit like, uh, like uh, Gertler and Karadi, or do we think that the central bank is just really um, trying to offset the ZLB? So um, I think these are all considerations that I would have liked to see a bit discussed a bit more uh, in the paper. All right, so to conclude, I think this paper provides a great work of course model of reserve management and it does a really good job at highlighting the, uh, the complicated connections between reserve policy, interest rate uh, spreads, and uh, the government uh, budget and taxation. Um, the normative analysis is a great baseline. Um, I wonder if distortionary taxation is really the main uh, cost that we view to the issuance of liquidity. Um, I think the connection with tax instruments should be dealt a bit in a more in-depth way. Um, and also the allocative role of liquidity and the composition of the central bank portfolio. Um, and another aspect that it's totally beyond the scope of this paper, but might be interesting and related, is the interaction with active financial markets and communication aspects and avoiding taper tantrums and so on. Um, so thanks for a great paper. It was very thought provoking. Uh, and thank you again for inviting me to discuss.
Um, thank you very much, Elisa. Um, I'm getting uh, messages here from the organizers that uh, we're running out of time. Basically, we've exhausted even the whole uh, break uh, time. So unfortunately, we'll have to uh, break up the session here, but uh, I guess you can interact also bilaterally with Pierpaolo on, on the comments. And, and uh, I think it was a lot of interesting food for thought and, and, and a very interesting paper. So I'm really sorry that uh, I cannot uh, go into more details in the discussion, but uh, you know, there's a, a time limit, which I've been asked to uh, strictly adhere to here now.